All right, why don't we get started? Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Megan Sweezy Fogarty and I'm a parent volunteer here at Pitzer College and have been a member of the Family Leadership Council for the past two years. And just as a reminder, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we have an open meeting of the Family Leadership Council. So please join us to learn more about how families really help Pitzer thrive. But this morning, it's my pleasure to start this session and introduce our speaker, Professor Sarah Gilman. And it's always such a joy in Family Weekend to have these very intimate um, opportunities to connect with some of our faculty. Sarah is the Associate Professor of Biology at Keck Science uh, Department. She has been with the college since you just said 2007, but it says 2016 here, but I'm going to go with 2007. <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> she received her PhD uh, population biology from University of California, Davis, and her recent courses, uh, really a dynamic, dynamic spread here, the Living Sea, Marine Ecology, Introductory Biology, Biogeography, Applied Biostatistics, Contesting Science, and science in the public imagination. So we definitely see these Pitzer values in, in the way you teach. So thank you for joining us for this special session titled Predicting Vulnerability to Climate Change in Coastal Marine Species. And now I'll turn it over and welcome Professor Sarah Gilman. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Um, one of the other things I'll add, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, one of the other things I'll add to my bio is for the past couple of years, I've also been the director of the first year seminar program. Um, so those last two courses that Megan mentioned, um, contesting science and science in the public interest were actually freshman seminar courses, um, which is one of the really fun things for me about being at Pitzer because I get to teach not just the traditional science courses, but also explore with students how science, um, interact, how people interact with science in their daily lives. Um, so I'm going to switch over and share slides. Uh, let's see, and start my talk. And I think, where did all my things go? Okay, so I had kind of planned, so, okay. Let's see, so there's the title of my talk, Predicting Vulnerability to Climate Change. I'm a marine ecologist by, by training, so my background um, is uh, in marine organisms. And most recently I've been studying how climate change and temperature changes affect species in these communities. Um, and if my slides will advance, there we go. Oh, they got, formatting got a little messed up. Um, so I actually was gonna start with a quiz for the parents here today or the family members here today, because um, this, uh, this slide summarizes a recent report from the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, um, which shows that, that only 8% of Americans have, an, have a knowledge equivalent to an A or a B um, in terms of uh, climate change, and thus many Americans um, need a better understanding in order to be informed citizens. Um, so I thought I, we could compare how you guys, um, uh, your knowledge of climate change with the, with the uh, people who were surveyed in the survey. Um, and I was gonna set up polls, but I think we're a small enough group, I can actually have you guys shout out your answers. So let's start with what I hope is an easier question. Um, or an easy, on the easy end of the spectrum. So which of these comes closer to your own view? A, most scientists think global warming is happening. B, most think global warming is not happening. C, there's a lot of disagreement about scientists or D, don't know enough to say. So feel a. free to unmute yourself. And a. Just a. A. a, yes, <laughs> so you guys are right. And this was one of the few areas where uh, where the people in this who were surveyed actually did well and they got the right answer too. Most scientists do think global warming is happening. Um, and as an example, um, here's just one review. Uh, this is from a 2007 study by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which looked at 29,436 different published papers on some aspect of climate change, physical or biological changes, 90% of which were consistent with patterns of warming. Um, so some examples of that are the date at which snow, mills, snow melts occur, whether great glaciers are growing or shrinking, when the trees bud out and bloom, those kinds of things are all happening earlier than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
let's see, for those of you who don't know how many, how many of you, I, this is where I usually ask my students, how many of you have heard of the IPCC before? I see most of you don't actually have your screens on. Um, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is an international organization that's chartered by the United Nations and, and the WMO or the World Meteorological Organization. Um, back in 2007, when Al Gore won his Nobel Prize for his work on climate change, he actually technically only won half a Nobel Prize and the other half went to this organization. Mm -hmm. um, so they, this is a group of scientists and other researchers who, whose primary purpose is to, or who are chartered with studying the state of knowledge on climate change. So they don't actually do research directly, but they monitor what is known. Um, and just really quick for those of you who are, um, who haven't seen this before, how I wanna walk through the mechanism of how climate is, climate is warming. Um, and that's the greenhouse effect um, so basically most of the heat on the earth comes from the sun. See if I can get this to work for me. Yeah, there we go. Oops, go back one. In terms of light that goes, um, goes through the atmosphere, hits the earth's surface, warms up the surface of the earth the same way as if you go stand out in the sun on a sunny day, you can feel the surface of your body warming up. When that happens, your body starts to actually radiate heat back toward, back into the atmosphere, into the air around you, so does the surface of the earth. Um, so that heat, ooh, the slides are not cooperating with me, that heat goes back out. Um, and then greenhouse gases, things like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually capture some of that heat. So those gases are permeable to light, to the energy when it comes in at light, but they hold onto it as heat and radiate it back down. And the reason it's called the greenhouse effect is because it works exactly the same way as the glass panes in a, in a greenhouse or a solarium where they let the light through, but, but once that light heats up what's inside the greenhouse, um, they hold that heat in. That is the basic idea. Um, so this was gonna be my next question, but the, it looks like when I transferred these to my iPad, the formatting got all messed up. So I'm just gonna tell you where we're going and you guys won't have to be pulled. Um, most Americans do not know this, but in the, in the mid 19th century, there were about 290 parts per million um, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And thanks to the industrial revolution, there's now 390, I think this slide is a little old, we're actually over 390 parts per million. So the amount of carbon dioxide is going up. Um, we know from historical data, from geological data, this is, um, this is uh, data collected from ice bubbles trapped in, um, in, in glaciers in, I think this one's from Antarctica that there's a general correlation between the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the temperature of, of the earth. <laughs> um, and I wanna point out that correlation itself doesn't always imply causation. My favorite counter example of this is um, somebody put this up on the internet uh, on a website you can find um, who's, who's <laughs> arguing not seriously that climate change is caused by a decline in the number of pirates because as the number of pirates has gone down over time, the global temperature of the earth has gone up. In the case of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have an understanding of the physics and the chemistry of what those molecules are actually doing up in the atmosphere and how that is changing the earth's climate. Um, a lot of that understanding comes from what are called global climate models or global circulation models, um, which are these giant computer models um, that are designed to simulate the climate of the earth and all of the interactions between the earth and the ocean and the atmospheres and the biological organisms living on it. Um, so this little graphic um, is from NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in, um, in Boulder, Colorado, which is one of the groups that does this kind of modeling. There's about a dozen or so different groups around the world, um, a couple in the US, one in the UK, one in Germany, Japan. I can't remember where the rest are. Um, so it's a very detailed model of the physics of the climate, the physics and chemistry of the climate or mathematical model. Um, it's so complex that I don't know if you guys can see this here, but it requires about 3 trillion computer calculations to simulate a single day of global climate. Um, and then these models are tested by comparing them to each other and comparing their ability to predict past a climate so that we have a good sense of, of um, so that, so that we, if they can predict the past accurately, then we have a good, we have more confidence in their ability to predict the future. But in terms of predicting um, the future of climate change and how much and where and when climate is going to change, 
the physics and the chemistry, the physical side of it is really only half the story. And the other half the story is, is, is the people, the decisions we made, not just as individuals, but sort of on political and international levels. Um, so one of the things I always like to stress to my students and one of the things I think Pitzer students are really good at um, are really poised to be these kind of people who are poised at kind of the interface between understanding the science and understanding how human systems, sociology, anthropology, economics, how those things affect the science. Um, and that's really the hardest part in some ways that those three trillion computer calculations a day are easy, but understanding how quickly new technologies are gonna arise, how quickly countries are gonna share technologies, those kinds of things are gonna have a big effect on how quickly we can control uh, greenhouse gas emissions and limit um, warming temperatures. And that requires understanding not just science, but social science. Okay, so next question, we can just do a show of hands or a shout out. If we were to stop burning fossil fuels today, um, global warming would stop almost immediately, true or false? How many of you say true? False. False, false. good. Okay, yes, in fact, um, uh, let's see. I think there's another bit to this slide, but it's not coming up for me. There we go. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So the way I think of this is that the carbon dioxide that came out of the tailpipe of my parents' car when they drove me to school in the 70s is still up there in the atmosphere, right? And it's being added to um, by the emissions that I make when I drive to the grocery store. Um, so, so uh, and here's, um, this is from a more recent IPCC report that I'll walk you through this. Uh, um, the black line here is the current amount of, or is the global temperature over the past 100 years or so from 1900 to 2000. This yellow line here, or this orangey yellow line here is the amount of warming we would expect to see if we shut off, if we had shut off all carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2000, you would still get about a half a degree of warming over what the temperature was in the year 2000. And that's because of that carbon dioxide hanging around in the atmosphere for hundreds of years or more. These other um, lines on these figures are these different scenarios. So the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change puts out these different models or these different scenarios for how quickly um, greenhouse gas emissions will rise in the atmosphere. And then those scenarios get put into those, the different global circulation models. Um, to, to make predictions about possible ranges of climate change. And they use a range of scenarios that again, reflect that range of different, um, predicting different human activities, right? So how quickly are we gonna be able to slow emissions and how much are different countries gonna cooperate to do that? So the, 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 the ones labeled B here, which is blue here, are, are more optimistic views of how quickly we can control carbon dioxide emissions and the A's are more pessimistic. You see. Um, higher overall rates of warming. I think the A1F1 is if we just do nothing and just let um, um, uh, commission emissions uh, continue to rise and control. Is there a, a question? Okay, I'm happy to answer questions if anybody wants to, has, has a question. Hi. Um, so you can see there's a range of different scenarios. Um, what I wanted to talk to you today, because I'm, I'm a marine biologist by training, is the effects of climate change um, on the oceans. And I'll give you a few examples of that generally, and then I'll talk a little bit about the research I've been doing with students here in Southern California. Um, so uh, warming temperatures or climate, one of the biggest or most obvious effects of climate change is warming temperature. And that's not just air temperature, but the temperature of the oceans is also expected to rise. Um, more slowly than the surface of the land, but it's also supposed to get warmer. Um, we expect to see, sorry, the formatting is a little bit off on this, but we expect to see increases in sea level, and that's as glaciers and ice caps melt and put more water into the ocean. Um, that will cause sea level to rise. Um, we also expect to see changes in uh, pH, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's because as carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, it actually also is absorbed in the ocean and it directly affects the pH of the ocean. Um, and then we also expect to see changes in the frequencies of storms and the sizes of waves hitting the shore. 
Um, so just to, here's an example. This is a slide I love to show my students. This is a picture of, I took from the New York Times a few years ago when the highest high tide of the year in Venice coincided with a big storm a day or two earlier. So there was a lot of extra water around. Um, and this I believe is a fairly, I've never been to Venice, but this is a, a fairly famous tourist site that was under several feet of water. So sea level rise is important because a, a huge percentage of human population lives near in coastal habitats, including Venice, but also Southern California, obviously. Um, and and um, there's great risk uh, for you know, damage to uh, the physical structures and the livelihoods of the people who live in those areas. Um, the most immediate response to that is usually to build seawalls. So that's what you see here. This is a photo, I think, from South Carolina showing um, a, a, you know, buildings in the background and then a park um, that you can see is, is already being defended by what's called riprap or rock, which is to keep, uh, um, to keep the park from eroding away as the waves hit the shore. And you can imagine as sea level rises that the riprap or rock is gonna have to be built higher and higher. Um, and that's to obviously to protect and minimize the economic damage of the sea level rise. So it's important to protect um, humans and people's livelihoods and homes. Um, but what it does is, um, if you see here, there's this small little stretch of mud flat or sand flat down here. This is a particular habitat. Um, the organisms that live here um, are intertidal, which is the area that I work in. They like to be out of water for part of the day during low tide and underwater for part of the day during high tide. And as sea levels rise and the water gets higher and the walls get higher to keep the water away from the land, this habitat is gonna be lost. It's gonna be submerged um, 24 hours a day eventually. And the, the species that, that live in that intertidal environment will be replaced by species that are adapted to the subtitle to being submerged even longer. Um, so that's sea level rise. Um, one of the scarier things is ocean acidification, um, which is cleverly labeled shell hell in this, in this newspaper article. Um, I think this is from the Manchester Guardian. But um, basically carbon dioxide moves into the, moves from the, diffuses from the atmosphere into the oceans um, where it actually reacts chemically with the water molecules. And that um, releases free hydrogen molecules which changes the pH of the ocean. And <clears throat> um, that affects all the organisms living in the ocean because we are all adapt, our bodies are all adapted to work at certain pH levels and not others, but it's particularly problematic for things that make calcium carbonate skeletons. So that includes things like, like snails, um, uh, mussels, clams, and corals, um, because as you change the pH, you make it energetically more costly to make those skeletons. So it becomes harder to make a living. Um, one of the organisms, one example of this, um, this is from a paper that came out in Nature where they exposed um, plankton, tiny microscopic creatures living in the ocean um, to different levels, to different pH levels to see what would happen. So these are three different species of, I think these are all photosynthetic plankton. Um, the one on the left here is called Emiliana huxleyi. It's actually a really cool species. It forms these huge um, algal blooms every year in the North Seas that apparently you can actually see from space. So off the coast of Greenland, you'll see just miles and miles of bright green ocean. Um, and that's these little essentially tiny swimming plants that are photosynthesizing like crazy and growing like crazy. They also happen to have, even though they're only one cell big, they happen to have a calcified skeleton. Um, and so when you grow them at a higher pH water, what happens is those skeletons, and these are examples from three different species actually break down. And so they lose the ability to function. And these guys are very, very small not as cute and charismatic as a whale, but very, very important in the food web and the food chain. If they disappear, if they can't adapt to these changes in pH, um, we may lose a lot of things that depend on these for food. Um, okay. Uh, so the area of the, or the effect of climate change that I'm most interested in is how temperatures, particular warming temperatures affect species overall distribution. So where they occur broadly. And there's a general prediction, obviously, that as you warm temperatures, um, that's going to change uh, species distributions and move them to areas that are cooler and more close to the temperatures they were used to experiencing. So what you basically get 
um, is if you think about the distribution of a species across latitude, that the lower latitudes end of its distribution closer to the equator, you may see extinctions of populations as conditions get too warm, but then on that northern end, um, closer to the poles, um, for any particular species, it would expand into new areas um, as those conditions, which used to be too cold, are now tolerable. Um, so that works along any gradients. So latitude is the one I think about, but also along um, elevation. So as you move, say, from the a valley floor up into the mountains, you'll see a change in species that are adapted to different temperatures. And the hope is that the species would just be able to move up into colder environments um, to minimize the negative effects of those warming temperatures. So that's the prediction. And we do see that happening for some species. So for example, this is um, a figure from a paper that came out looking at the latitude that fish species were caught um, in the, what's the North Sea? Uh, in commercially caught, so European fish uh, were commercially caught um, off the coast of England. Sorry, I just noticed there's a lot. Oh, okay, never mind. There are a few notes to me in the chat I didn't see before, but I saw now. Um, and what you can see is that in years with warmer water temperature, this is I think like 10 or 20 years of data, the average latitude at which uh, fishermen are catching these fish actually moves north. So the whole fish communities are shifting north in warm years and then in cool years because climate change is not a continuous upward thing, but it'll go up, down, up, down, up, down a little bit. In those cooler years, they shift back down a little bit. Um, so that's one example of a species distribution changing. Um, but not all species are showing that. So what this, this cartoon is trying to show you is the range of different ways that a species distribution can respond to climate change. Um, so here's our, here's our range march or a range shift. In some cases, species might expand into, into higher latitude areas uh, without going extinct in the warmer parts of the range. In some cases, they might go extinct and not expand. In some cases, we might see changes in abundance without changes in range boundaries. So there's a whole range of patterns that we're actually seeing. And the question is really what's driving those patterns and can we predict where, which populations of a species are gonna be vulnerable and which populations of a species are, um, are gonna be fine. And what one of the things I'm really interested in is these kind of holes in the distribution. So places where abundances are lower in areas that you think would be otherwise um, perfectly good in terms of temperature for where that organism can live. Um, and the community I'm gonna talk about today that we've been studying this in is the intertidal zone, which I mentioned briefly before, um, but this is the part of the shoreline. This is what most people think of it as the beach, right? It's the part of the shore that is underwater at high tide and exposed to the air at low tide. And the communities I'm most interested in are these rocky shore communities, which is not probably where you would wanna lay out your beach blanket um, but are home to a diverse range of different organisms. And they have to deal with a lot of really harsh physiological stresses, right? They're getting dried out at low tide. They're getting, they may get pounded by waves on any given day at, at, as the tide is changing and then they're underwater. Um, by and large, the species that live here are marine in origin. So they're used to living underwater. They breathe and feed when they're underwater. And the high tide or the low tide part of each day is just something they have to tolerate for the most part before the water comes back in. Um, but when we look at the temperatures that animals experience in, during that low tide part of the day up and down the west coast of the US, we find some interesting patterns. Um, so if you look here, so um, this is from a paper by Brian Helmuth who actually was my postdoc advisor many years ago, um, showing, uh, let's see, annual maximum and average daily maximum temperatures for sites ranging from Washington, Oregon down to, down to central California. And while you might be able to kind of see a climb in temperature where the lower latitude sites, the sites closer to the equator are warmer, you can also see a lot of noise. We have what we call hot spots. Some of the warmest temperatures on these sites are actually up in the San Juan Islands um, near Seattle. Um, some cold sites are actually down near Santa Barbara and everything in between. So my, my, my interest is whether those, this variation, these kind of hot and cold spots, um, how that affects uh, populations, uh, different populations of a species ability to tolerate warming temperature. Cause you might imagine these colder sites, if they're not 
that much, or if they're a lot colder than some of these other sites, the warming temperatures may not affect species as much. Um, and so they may be, persist in these locations where they would go extinct in these locations. So that's the kind of thing I'm interested in, how that spatial pattern of temperature affects this, the um, success of populations at different points up and down the coast. Um, the species that I work in is this intertidal, is a intertidal barnacle. Probably most of you don't spend a lot of your day thinking about barnacles. <laughs> um, I've come to love them, um, but basically they are crustaceans. They are related to things like crabs and shrimp. They start out as a larva that swims around in the water column for a couple of weeks. You can see it kind of looks a little bit shrimp-like here. And then when it's ready to mature, it returns to shore, cements itself down to the rock, sticks its legs in the air, um, and spends the rest of its life um, as a sessile adult um, feeding with its legs. And I think I have a video. Yeah, so here's a video. I don't know if that's working over Zoom. Um, I think the, the, the feeding appendages, they're called cirri. I, I find it fascinating just to, to stare at them. I think they're really beautiful. But then again, I'm a little weird, so. Um, so those are them. This is just another diagram of the life cycle of a barnacle. This is the species that I'm working on. It's distributed um, all the way from uh, Mexico down into Baja, all the way up into Alaska. Um, it actually a little bit of trivia. The, the species was actually named by Darwin because he was the first European um, to collect them on the voyage of the Beagle. He actually wrote a whole monograph on barnacle species or barnacle species and named a lot of the species we have on the West Coast. Okay, so there's one other piece in order to predict how that variation in temperature at different locations affects the success of the barnacle and its ability to tolerate warming. And that's what the, how temperatures relate to the physiological tolerances of the barnacle themselves. And in physiology of ectotherms of species that don't control their own body temperature, so not like us, not birds and mammals, but pretty much any other animal, um, lizards, insects, barnacles, fish, where their body temperature is basically determined by the habitat they live in. When we look at how successful, say, a population is at different temperatures, we, there is a stereotypical sort of what's called a thermal performance curve that's shown here. At very cold temperatures, most animals, most exotherms do not do very well. Um, as you warm them up, their performance slowly improves. And what we measure here on the y-axis could be anything from the rate of one enzyme and one reaction in that organism's body to the feeding rate or the running speed of a lizard. Um, it's kind of cool that at different scales, all the way down from the biochemistry to the, physio to the physiology, you get the same shape of a curve. So you get this very slow increase in performance or success as you warm up temperature, and then eventually you hit a peak and then there's a steep, steep fall down the other side. Um, this is usually called a thermal optimum where the peak is, it's called T-opt. Um, and so the question is for any given population of any organism, are they gonna, are, do they happen to be living in this part of their thermal performance curve where a little bit of warming might actually be good for them? Or do they happen to be living in this part of their thermal performance curve where a little bit of warming is gonna push them down over the other side? So that's what, we've been looking at in, in my lab for these barnacles. And we've been looking at that specifically at three different sites that show a range of different temperatures, um, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. So the three sites I'm gonna talk about today are Friday Harbor, which is up in the San Juan Islands. It's a little island between um, Seattle and uh, Vancouver Island, which is this big piece here. Um, Bodega Bay, which is a little bit north of San Francisco. Um, on the California coast. And then our third population is from Long Beach, which is, which is down here near Claremont. Um, when you look at the temperatures of these three sites, if I can make the slide change, there we go. Um, and look at what these animals experience during low tide. And remember, I told you it was low tide where, they, where they're stressed, where they're getting um, hotter temperatures, where they can't feed or, or breathe. And they're just trying to, trying to get through the tide until the water comes back. Um, this Friday Harbor site is kind of unique for being really warm. It was the warmest site on that other figure I showed you guys. Um, so what you see is even though Friday Harbor is our northernmost site, the, the hottest temperatures it sees in the summer are actually much more similar to typical hot summer temperatures down here in Los Angeles or Long Beach. And both are much, much warmer than Bodega Bay. 
which is north of San Francisco, which is a much colder, foggier environment. So even when the tide is out, it's a pretty cold place to be in the summer. Um, all the data I'm going to show you is in centigrade because that's the temperature of science. I am really bad at translating centigrade into Fahrenheit and back and forth. But so if you're kind of curious what these temperatures are, the ones I always remember is 20 degrees is about room temperatures, about 68 or 70 Fahrenheit. And 37 is about human body temperature. So you can kind of say the warmest temperatures these guys experience is like us on a day we have a fever. Right, and some sites never get nearly that warm as we would get, as our bodies get on a normal day. And again, this is at low tide when they're out in the air and being baked by the sun. At high tide, when they're under the water, my slide will change, they're actually much colder, right? So as nice as Friday Harbor is to hang out in in the summertime, I would never wanna actually go swimming in the water there. Same for Bodega Bay, because the temperatures are much colder. These are getting close to refrigerator temperatures basically. Um, whereas it, down here in Southern California, once you get south of Santa Barbara, the temperatures are a lot warmer. So we have these three different sites, one which is consistently warm here in Southern California, one which is consistently cold. And then this Friday Harbor site, which is really interesting because it has the low tide conditions of Southern California, but the high tide temperatures um, of, of sites at higher latitudes. So what I'm really interested in figuring out is how do these different temperature environments affect the physiology of the barnacle? Are barnacles really adapting to their water temperature, or sorry, their water temperature conditions or their air temperature conditions? And how much capacity do they have for tolerating warmer air temperatures if temperatures were more warm? Um, so just to kind of show that graphically, what we're gonna talk about is measuring the thermal performance curves of these three different populations um, and you can think of it as two different hypotheses. So because Bodega Bay is consistently colder than Long Beach than Southern California, we expect that thermal performance curve for barnacles from Bodega Bay to be much colder, right? Their peak temperatures, the temperature they do best at will be colder than the Southern California barnacles. Um, now for Friday Harbor, if it's water temperature that drives the physiology of the animals, if they're adapting to being to the temperatures they experience when they're underwater, because that's when they're feeding and that's when they're really living their lives, then we would see the Friday Harbor curve being very similar to the Bodega Bay curve. Um, but the other hypothesis you can think of is that if the low tide conditions, if they have to adapt to those and be able to tolerate that, then you would see the Friday Harbor population's thermal performance curve um, come out closer to the Long Beach, the Southern California population. So that's what we set out to test in our lab. Um, and I just have a few data slides to, uh, before I show you the answer to that question, or a few method slides. Um, the way that we study barnacles, so they're sessile as adults. So what we usually do is just hang plastic tiles off of docks like this, wait for larvae to settle on them. They'll settle on anything. I mean, the Navy spends millions of dollars a year trying to keep barnacles off their boats. Um, so just any random piece of plastic you hang up a dock, they'll settle on, and then you can bring them back into the lab. Um, in the lab, we put them on a tidal cycle. That's what this figure is trying to show where they have too high and too low tides a day, and then some daylight as well. Um, and I think we were simulating summer conditions, so they have more daylight each day than, than nighttime. Um, and then to do these experiments, we actually put them through a simulated high and low tide. So we start them off in our experimental chambers at high tide to get them kind of relaxed and comfortable. And then we remove the water for five hours, heat them to a different temperature, one of these temperatures, keep them there for the rest of the five hours, um, and then put them back into high tide conditions for six more hours. Throughout all of this, um, we are measuring how much oxygen they consume. So how much, which is essentially a me measure of how much energy they're using. And that's what we're gonna use to, to shape, fit our thermal performance curves. Um, so here is uh, another just close up view. These are our individual barnacles in their low tide chambers. You'll notice they have tiny little dots of paint on them. That's how we tell them apart. We give them a, a color marking. Um, here they are in our high tide chambers. You can see these black cables here. Those are the actual oxygen sensors that are measuring the oxygen inside these chambers. Um, uh, these are a couple of uh, students and a postdoc who did this work with me. Um, so with these crazy 12 hour experiments, which I think I'm never gonna do again, um, we were 
working in shifts. So some of us were coming in at six or seven in the morning to set up the experiment and get it going. And then when we switched over from high to high to or low tide to high tide, um, the other pair of us would come in and take over the rest of the experiment. Um, so Maddie here on the left graduated from Pitzer uh, a year or two ago, one he is a senior this year. And then this is Gordon Ober, who was a postdoctoral researcher in my lab who helped with this experiment. He's now a professor at Endicott College on the East Coast. So that's the setup in terms of what happened. Here's my slide. So here is the respiration data for, I'm gonna start with the Bodega Bay population in the middle. And what you can see each of these dots is a different individual barnacle at a different temperature treatment. And then this just showing on the Y axis, how much oxygen it consumed. And you can see sort of a general shape of a thermal performance curve. First of all, the data is noisy because every barnacle has its own opinion of what it should be doing when we put it in these chambers. But on average, they fit a thermal performance curve or just a, um, a quadratic curve with a peak around 23 and a half degrees C. Um, the Southern, oops, wrong button. The Southern California population, you can see we actually didn't go warm enough to get to a peak temperature. So it's maintaining high performance all the way up to 38 degrees C, which was the warmest temperature that we used in this experiment. Um, and now the interesting thing is this Friday Harbor population because it falls out with a performance curve much more closer to Bodega Bay. So they both peak around 25 degrees ish. Whereas the Long Beach, we couldn't even find the peak because it was still going warmer. Um, interestingly, the reason that we didn't use temperatures higher than 38 degrees is because the first population we did this experiment on, the Friday Harbor population, that um, was lethal. So, so they all died when we tried 40 degrees. But I wonder if we did that with the Long Beach, the Southern California barnacles, if we could actually get them up to much hotter temperatures without killing them. Um, so in terms of our original hypotheses, um, it's the one on the right here, the idea that water temperature drives their physiology. So what they can tolerate in air is determined by their local water temperatures and they seem to be, each population seems to be adapted to its local water temperatures. And that is going to create kind of a problem for these Friday Harbor barnacles because they are adapted to the colder temperatures, but during summer low tides, they're experiencing the warmer temperatures and some of the warmest temperatures on the coast. So of these three populations, it's this Friday Harbor population that I'm most worried about losing the barnacles completely as temperatures warm. The other two populations, warming temperatures um, are still gonna be well within the range of what they can tolerate. Um, so those are the main points um, that I wanted to bring up. And um, I think I just have an acknowledgement slide. Um, one of the fun things about working at a place like a Claremont College is, is the amazing number of, of talented students that you get to work with. And so the two that worked on this particular project uh, were Maddie and Juanita. Um, and then I've also been lucky enough to have um, a research grant that supported salary for two different postdoctoral researchers, Rhiannon and Rongstad uh, first, and then Gordon Over, who were also involved in um, this project and a lot of other projects. And then many, many other students who've worked over the years on different projects in my lab. Um, I think that's all the slides I have. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and I'm happy to answer questions. If anybody has questions about the research. As I always say, my students, I, I can't possibly have explained it all clearly. <laughs> you must have a question somewhere, Holly. I, I do you also study methane or is that a totally different um, piece of uh, research? Yeah, so I don't, I don't study methane directly. Methane is, is, is kind of a scarier greenhouse gas in a lot of ways because it warms the atmosphere a lot faster than carbon dioxide. Um, but that's not something that um, I work on directly. Have the students been able to continue research with COVID? The, not this year, no. <laughs> we're not allowed. We're not allowed to be on campus to do research right now. We're only allowed on campus to teach. Um, we've been working with. Actually, I've been lucky in that I have a couple other projects 
um, that are computer-based that students can work on. So one of the other pieces of this project comparing these three different populations um, is, is actually measuring growth rates of barnacles in the wild at each of these three sites, um, which is pretty easy to do since they don't move. We just go up there every few months and take photographs. But it means I have lots of photographs um, that, that need to be measured on a computer using computer software to see how much each barnacle is growing over time. And so we've been working on that this year since I can't actually get anybody into the lab this year. I can ask a question. Um, Go ahead. I'm curious, how do you see your research evolving over the next five years? Do you feel like it's gonna be similar or are there other objectives that you're looking for? So this particular project, um, I'm actually nearly done with. We've, we've kind of measured barnacles every way we can imagine. Um, so this one is wrapping up. The grant funding is winding down. <coughs> I'm actually kind of excited to start something new after doing this for five years. Um, so I think my next project, I think we'll be working, looking at snails that, that actually feed on the barnacles and how they're affected. Um, which is kind of fun. You can do all kinds of cool projects with students where they, you know, essentially take time lapse videos of snails feeding and measure how fast they feed under different, different conditions, um, which is actually a really nice project for students to work on. It's it's much less like the doing that respirometry measure, taking those oxygen measurements. You have to be very meticulous, and um, it gets kind of monotonous after a while. Whereas watching videos of snails run around a tank is kind of a lot more fun. So that's where I'm going next. Other questions? Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for doing this and your work. Really appreciate it. My brother, or sorry, my nephew actually lives at Bodega Bay. That's the UC Davis don't they have the lab there? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I started using that as a site. I, that's where I did my PhD work. Yeah. Yeah. He looks at CN, um, sorry, what's the, uh, not see an enemy. Trying to think of the other thing that people get off of rocks, they deep dive to get them. And now we oh, don't know. Oh, urchins or abalone. Abalone. Yeah. He yeah. works on acidification with abalone, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining.